firstly want to thank uh, all of you for, for joining us today for this uh, panel on impact investing and social enterprise in Australia. Um, as you've seen, we have a, a great set of panelists to, to talk with you. My name is Leisa Issa Odidi. Um, I'm one of the founding members of the, the leadership committee of Harvard Alumni Entrepreneurs Australia. Um, and I'm also a, a, an associate partner at Dahlberg Advisors, which is a social impact and uh, international development advisory firm that operates globally. Um, I'll say a couple of words very quickly about HAE before uh, moving on. Um, and that is that we're, we're a fairly new organization uh, founded earlier this year in the throes of lockdown, as with so many other things. Um, and what we're really trying to do is connect and bring together people who are interested in investing in entrepreneurship uh, to learn, to exchange, um, and really meet. Uh, and so you can imagine we're very excited for 2021 when we can hopefully take you know we, what we've been doing thus far, which has mostly been these sort of Zoom uh, panels and webinars. Um, and move it into a, a more sort of in-person physical space to facilitate those connections even more. Um, a few housekeeping things before I introduce our panelists. Um, first things first, you'll, you'll notice that we are recording. Um, there's been sort of a lot of interest both in Australia and the United States to, to see this session um, on the HAE website. So uh, just an FYI that recording and, and this will be sort of produced and, and put online. Um, the second, uh, I would say, is uh, I certainly have lots of questions for our panelists, um, but would really love for this to be more interactive. So uh, please drop uh, questions into the chat area. And certainly in the second half of the session, I think we'll uh, open it up for opportunities for folks to turn on their videos um, and, uh, and ask questions directly of the panelists. Um, and then Perhaps the very last thing I'll say is, uh, if you're not a panelist, please, please do keep yourself on mute. Um, and I think, you know, fine to have videos on, I think just for, for a couple of people, uh, but mostly wanna make sure we can focus on the face of the person speaking. Um, so without much further ado, let me go ahead and introduce our panelists. Uh, first off, we have Gemma Lloyd, who's the co-founder of Work 180. And this is the only job platform that actually pre-screens employers to see how well they support women's careers. Um, Gemma co-founded Work 180 after a decade in the tech industry. And she and her co-founder have had great success over the past few years in raising capital and scaling, not just in Australia, but globally as well. So very much looking forward to the perspective uh, Gemma can bring from her experience as an entrepreneur in the space. Um, Thanks, Gemma. Secondly, we have uh, Will Richardson, who is the head of venture capital and impact uh, at the Impact Investment Group. Will is also the managing director of the Giant Leap Fund, uh, which invests in rapidly scalable and early stage businesses that target, of course, both profit and social impact. And so he can share his experience from that sort of critical intermediary perspective at the intersection of uh, entrepreneurs and investors. Uh, finally, we have Michael Trail. Michael's the executive director for Purpose Investment Partners. Uh, he was the founding chief, chief executive of Social Ventures Australia, which as many of you will know, is a nonprofit organization providing consulting, advocacy and investing uh, services to alleviate uh, disadvantage across Australia. Michael also chairs the government social impact investing task force and sits on a variety of boards, uh, including chairing that of the Paul Ramsey Foundation. So I say all of that, not just to heap accolades on our panelists, but to really uh, give a sense of the broad set of perspectives and, and sort of stakeholders that we have on the line. Uh, so um, let's go ahead and actually turn it over uh, to our panelists to, to each maybe take two to three minutes themselves and, and just share a little bit more in detail about uh, the work that they do um, and sort of how it relates to this question of scaling social enterprise. Uh, maybe let's start with uh, Gemma and then we can move to Will and then to, to Michael. Yeah, thank you, um, Laisa. So um, as mentioned, I'm the CEO of Work180 and uh, we're a social enterprise and our purpose is to essentially work towards closing that gender gap. And it's to empower every woman to choose a workplace where they can thrive. And so we're a venture scale business, but essentially we're doing good along the way. And um, we're doing that by connecting women with best practice employers. Um, from a social and, um, impact piece, the outcomes are things like employees who work with us are improving their benefits and policies, they're closing their gender pay gaps, they're increasing the number of women in leadership. Um, we're also balancing out the gender gap by enabling men to take more flexible work and pay parental leave and such. Um, and um, 
yeah, we were founded in 2015. Um, to date, we've raised $5.8 million in capital. We're across Australia and the UK. And obviously, um, Giant Leap is, is one of our social impact investors. Uh, good, morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so uh, I run the Giant Leap Fund. We're a seed fund focusing on 100% impact startup businesses, predominantly in Australia, but we do have some of an allocation to invest offshore. Um, so we were founded in 2016 um, and we really were founded to back uh, mission-driven founders that are seeking to build businesses that have impact that's built into their revenue models. So what we're looking to identify is businesses that um, as they scale, their impact is scalable as, as well. Um, so we're looking for tech-enabled tech businesses that are seeking to address some of society and the environment's biggest problems. Um, we are looking for commercial risk-adjusted returns from the investments that, that we make. So we're seeking venture-type returns um, like, like our peers in Australia. Um, we're currently outperforming top-tier managers in Australia of our vintage. Um, for, we've ha already had our first exit um, so what does that look like? We're, we're seeking portfolio returns of 20% um, IRR, net of fees and net of taxes. Um, our first investment uh, generated an IRR of over 30%. Um, we've got three themes that we invest across uh, at, at Giant Leap. The first is health and wellbeing. The second is sustainable living. And the third is empowering people. So Gemma's business uh, falls within our empowering people um, thematic. Um, just to give you a couple of examples of some of the other um, the other themes and some of our portfolio companies, we invested into a business called GoTerra, which is um, a waste management business. They process organic waste uh, through black soldier flies, which consume um, a really large amount of organic waste in a very short period of time. And, and effectively, those maggots end up be, becoming food for agriculture and aquaculture. And um, so that fits very squarely within our sustainable living theme. Um, we are also invested in a business that um, just received some press lately called um, Like Family. Um, so they're trying to address the major problem of loneliness in our communities. Um, so it fits within our, our health and wellbeing thematic. Uh, it's a husband and wife team um, led by Matthew and Jenna and happy laser to send through some press that you can share with the group subsequently. Um, but coming back to, to our tests for impact and how we determine whether a business fits within the Giant Leap's mandate, the first thing we do is we have a look at whether the business fits within one of those three themes. We're also trying to identify whether there's a, a single metric or maybe two metrics um, that identify the impact that's being created from every dollar of revenue that's being created by the startups that we back. And the third, which is much more of a, a subjective test and an objective test, is that we're trying to really understand the purpose behind um, the, the, the foundation or the genesis story of, of the businesses that are being created. So we. So, for example, with Gemma and her co-founder Valeria, we're really trying to understand why this this business is is their life's mission and why they're willing to dedicate so much of themselves to trying to address um, these social and environmental problems. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Will. It's great to be part of a conversation with Will and Gemma on a subject of such shared passion. In in terms of quick personal background, um, I. Um, I was a co-founder in the late 80s, showing my age, uh, of the bank's original private equity business. And I left that in 2002 to be involved in setting up an organisation called Social Ventures Australia. And at the heart of that was the idea of how could you apply in hopefully thoughtful and practical ways business and private equity disciplines to the challenge of backing not business but social entrepreneurs. Um, one of one of the one of the things is a quick practical example of that. We're involved in partnership with other nonprofits. Um, in raising capital to buy out of bankruptcy uh, just over 10 years ago, the old ABC childcare centres and turn that into what's uh, now a billion dollar social enterprise. 
Um, in the process of doing that, we raised $165 million of capital. And it was a much larger scale demonstration of work that we'd been doing in a range of different ways at Social Ventures Australia. And, and I think there's a broad ecosystem that's required to think about social enterprise and impact in investing. Um, Will and Gemma have just given brilliant practical examples of the early stage seed market and what success and what good likes it looks like in that. Um, and I'm sure we'll come back to that in detail in the conversation. I just wanted to quickly touch on good start in an area that I've been increasingly focused on over the last decade. I really do believe there's an opportunity uh, for larger scale impact investing in this country. We have a pool of $3 trillion of superannuation funding um, for purpose partners, which I'm, uh, which is the one executive role I have is really committed to the idea that you can originate larger scale transactions that would attract the investment interest of the, the major providers of capital and, and it's an area we've been, where I've been pretty focused on. So I might leave it at that. I'm sure we'll come back to much more detailed questions. There are other things around the work I've been involved in doing. I think it's a great thing that the federal government's actively interested in this. As was mentioned, I chair a federal government social impact investing task force. Um, and I think across the three of us, there'll be perspectives that bring to life, you know, what good can and should look like and what we need to do to try and make that happen. Great, thank you all for, for that intro and hopefully providing some context to the participants on the line from, from where you're speaking from. Um, maybe picking up on the last thing uh, you were talking about, Michael, actually the first question um, I would love to hear from you all about is, you know, where, where do you see at the broadest level a kind of key bottlenecks or challenges to scaling social enterprise in Australia? And um, you know that can be from the perspective of scaling a social enterprise within the ecosystem or from scaling the ecosystem itself. Um, and Michael, I know you've been tasked with answering just this question, so maybe we'll start with you. Yeah, no, thanks, thanks for, the, for, the, for the question. Um, part of the task force, uh, which has just delivered its final report to government, was a pretty extensive consultation process across the spectrum of earlier to later stage. And the two things that came out really strongly is gaps in the system um, pretty consistently in the round tables and they would accord with a, you know, the sort of more qualitative evidence that I would have seen. One was um, the lack of sophisticated capacity building and funding for particularly early stage uh, enterprises. Um, and in particular, what we kind of identified as the so-called valley of death gap in funding. And I'm talking about organisations where there might have been seed capital, you know, from friends and family. And then an early stage organisation gets to the point where it's got a track record, it's got some runs on the board, but that next smaller size, think $25,000 to $200,000 worth of kind of debt or soft debt funding, really hard to get hold of that, really uh, not a particularly sophisticated market. And in many cases, we heard and saw examples of that being a big hole. Um, and then the other gap uh, bears on the market that I just spoke to, the larger scale impact investing. There's a different set of challenges there. I think it's a hybrid of not enough case study examples. I mean, it still frustrates the hell out of me that Good Start, which is still used as a bit of poster child for what a large scale, high quality social enterprise could be. You know, my view in 2010, if you'd asked me, is that there'd be dozens of organisations like that, but there aren't. So the ability to originate those deals is one part of the challenge and gap. The other is uh, making sure that the super funds are aware of that opportunity and don't hide behind the sole purpose test, i.e. the idea that we've got to be completely fixated on commercial returns. We do believe there's a, the ability to get risk-weighted returns that would satisfy the sole purpose test. Um, and I think that's, a, that's something we need a, an education, awareness and practice campaign on. Great, thanks, Michael. Uh, well, I saw you just pop back on and off the video. Um, yeah, curious to hear your perspective here and sort of how and where it aligns with uh, with Michael's view. Um, I think one of the challenges is that impact is a, a really broad church. So um, some people think of impact as a philosophy. Um, some people think of it as an, an instrument, a financial instrument. Um, some people think of it as a specific asset class. Um, I guess I, I don't have a silver bullet. I don't have a single recommendation. Um, I, I don't even have the ability to identify a single bottleneck. Um, I think it's wonderful the work that Michael's done canvassing perspectives from the ecosystem really broadly. Um, for me, I think of it a bit like a greenhouse and uh, I think of it about how do you create the right conditions 
to create a, thi- a thriving ecosystem um, to enable incredible companies um, to, to be created, the right investors to emerge and to, to collaborate, um, the right independent actors, whether they be intermediaries or asset consultants or advisors, um, to be able to participate, to provide the right due diligence and the right advice at the right time. I think that um, there, there needs to be some sort of formal or informal market making mechanisms to be able to direct different groups into the right places. And maybe I'll just give you a couple, an, an example of an initiative that we've undertaken uh, from an ecosystem perspective to try and address this problem. So um, last year, we were fortunate to receive some money from the Victorian state government. Last year, we received some money from the Victorian state government to found something called the Impact Angel Network. So what we're really trying to do is help to create the conditions to be able to support early, the earlier stage market. So Michael was talking about the Valley of Death organizations getting founded, but not receiving money post friends and family to continue with their missions and their objectives. So what, what we did um, with, with um, fantastic investors like Michael, who's actually invested into the Giant Leap Fund, we're, we're able to aggregate incredible investors like Michael, who we see as impact angels onto our platform. We, we've taken the pipeline of investable opportunities that Giant Leap sees. We see about a thousand deals a year, but maybe we only invest in five to 10. So we, and we've created a marketplace to enable um, impact angels to connect up with these uh, impact opportunities and to share, share opportunities, share due diligence, share knowledge, club together into rounds to then um, support more businesses to come through the funnel to be ready for funding from groups like Giant Leap in the future. So for us, we don't see it as a single bottleneck. We don't see it as a single solution. We're trying to create the conditions for an ecosystem to thrive in and of itself. Maybe I'll pass to Gemma there. Yeah, well, I guess um, my first experience of raising capital, um, I so we launched in 2015, as I mentioned, and we went out trying to raise straight away. And we actually did get an offer of a million dollars very, very quickly. However, the conditions of that raise were that we didn't make this about women and the gender gap. And we just took kind of that job board kind of component that we had, which um, obviously we we turned down because that went against all of um, why we had started the business and our purpose as well. So I think that was um, an interesting pushback, particularly around that social impact piece that we were we were really driving. And then we did try and raise capital for about three years, not successfully, obviously, for that first three years, we bootstrapped and we grew the business to profitable. We reached 11 people before we actually um, then raised. But it's interesting trying to think about whether it's the social impact piece. But moreover than that, I actually think it was probably the barrier for us was being a women, a woman led startup rather than social impact business. Really interesting. And yeah, I definitely want to, to come back, maybe digging into that, Gemma, just to, you know, that first kind of $1 million experience. Was it the type of social impact that was being sought that, that you think may have been the issue? Or was it kind of the risk of focus on social impact period? No, like no offense to, you know, maybe people on the call, but it was like, you know, your middle-aged male that probably just didn't really get get it and see why a business like Work 180 would be so impactful to, you know, 50% of the, the population. Understood. Yeah, fair enough. So sort of communicating the, the theory of change there. Um, maybe the next question actually picks off of a couple of things that have already been said. Um, I think, Michael, uh, you made the point around kind of not enough case studies or examples and Will, you provided uh, kind of the example of the of the angel network. Um, you know, what are some successes that, that we can look to for, for impact investing in social enterprise in Australia? Um, and what can we learn from them um, kind of going forward to, to kind of address some of these bottlenecks? Um, yeah, no, look, I think it's a really fundamental question. What, you know, one of the things, and we reflected this in the interim report of the task force, um, which was controversial in, in, in some ways, but I think captured the, the, the truth, which is there's a bit of a sense that there's a number of really good practical case study examples. But if you look at the whole market of social impact, impact investing, it's still kind of a cottage industry. It doesn't have the degree of liquidity and sophistication that for those of us who've been involved in mainstream capital markets exists. And I was always struck by that, you know, having cut my teeth in 
venture capital and private equity, there are known pools of funding and networks. Um, and there's a degree of sophistication and knowledge. And Will made a point that I think is really important as part of that. There's a lot of uh, definitional ambiguity about social enterprise and impact investing, both in terms of clarity of what does social impact mean? What does it look like? How do you report against it? What is a reasonable financial return? Is there a trade-off between financial and social returns? And I think for those of us who've been involved as well, and Gemma and I have, um, I suspect it'd be heated agreement that it is possible to generate reasonable returns, but there will be examples where there's some sort of trade-off and there are funders for each of those categories. So, you know, to, to your question, I think, uh, you know, and, and they're on the call and Jim is a case study example. Will talked about examples of the sorts of things they're doing. I talked about Good Start as a larger scale. It's the biggest provider in the market. It's been financially successful and there's a bunch of social performance indicators around quality, around exclusion and what Good Start's done across a network of 72,000 families that's making a real difference and it's thrown its weight around in advocacy and policy. The problem is there's not enough of those that you could point to them and say, hey, I'm an early stage entrepreneur. Here's the half dozen to a dozen funders. Hey, I need capacity building and support. Where do I go? Hey, I've got a large scale impact investing opportunity. Who are the funders? Who are the major super funds who are really active in that market? And have got a portfolio of those in the same way as they've got portfolios, which are 6% allocated to, uh, to, to private equity. I mean, and just to close on that, I, I gave a TEDx talk on this, I think in 20. 14, and it shows you how much the market's moved. I said then when the market was 1.8 trillion, this should be recognised as a differentiated, high quality risk return weighted asset class. You know, what if, what if 2% of that 1.8 trillion was in larger scale impact investing? Uh, you know, it's simple maths. That, then that would have meant $36 billion. And I believe, and I still do, that's entirely possible. So when you step back from that, that was one of the challenges of the task force. How do you come up with a smart, integrated suite of things that the government can do as a enabler, as a catalyst to crowd in and make real that opportunity? And we don't think they have to do much, but there's a bunch of precedents. The UK, I think there's been some terrific work done that's built in sophistication. So long-winded answer, but I think the case study examples exist, but there's not the scale, not the liquidity, not the product understanding that we all take for granted in mainstream capital markets. Great, thanks. Will, do you, do you want to jump in from there? Yeah, I agree with everything that Michael just outlined. And for me, I feel like it's our responsibility and our duty to actually create the evidence sets to for the next generation. So we, we, we may not have as significant a direct impact through what we do, but there I think of it in terms of horizons. So um, I, I, and I'll give you an example. There's, there's a group um, called Capor Capital out of Oakland in the US. So it was established by Mitch and Frida Capor. So it's a family office and they're one of the largest seed check writers in the whole world. Um, and and their, their philosophy is that if you back founders from minority backgrounds, whether it be multicultural backgrounds or, or gender-based um, minorities, that your, your investments will outperform. So last year they released their report with their eight years of data and Capor Capital has generated 3x on their portfolio versus their peers of 1.8x. So they've got the direct impact of what they're doing through their portfolio. But uh, for me, what's really critical is all of the case studies of all of the founders that they've backed then go, and they don't just inspire the teams who work for them, they inspire university graduates or corporate SKPs looking to go start their own businesses and work for these teams. So for me, what I hope that we can do with amazing founders like Gemma in our portfolio is create that evidence set within the Australian context. So hopefully that there isn't just Giant Leap as the only 100% impact VC manager in, in five years time. There's, there's carbon copies of us and we become a bit like a, a sunset movement and we become less relevant and ultimately that the norms will shift that mainstream VCs end up seeing that impact um, generates out performance and that's how you can get leverage change in terms of the ultimate horizon where you can he help to shift the market and that's you know I have so much respect for Michael and what he's done because of him 
in terms of the what he created in terms of the mainstream private equity industry in Australia, he's gone to um, create the next generation, next next evolution of that through Social Ventures Australia. And now the work that he's doing is is again, it's 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 um, focusing on that next horizon. Great, Jama, do you want to jump in and and maybe it's especially interesting to hear sort of learnings from your own experience uh moving from that harder period into a successful one um yeah no i mean there's, there's i think michael and will really sum that up well so there's there's not um not a lot more i think to, to add to that uh great i think then maybe the next uh question and um, maybe I'll, I'll send that one back to you, Gemma, so you started to talk about from sort of the gender perspective. Um, it would be interesting to hear from your experience, um, you know, what types of impact investing do you think are maybe untapped or under, over, sort of under-indexed in, in the Australian market? Um, and that can be anything in terms of sort of the type of impacts targeted, the types of sort of risk return profiles or, or even financial instruments. Um, well, it's pro to be to be fair, that's probably not my area of expertise, Lisa. Around what's kind of, I think Will and Michael probably have a much more um, deeper knowledge around those potential areas that maybe are not really tapped into. I guess from my own personal experience, obviously, um, or my my from my seat, it's it's women, um, and I think um, there's a lot of research around women are more um, inclined to start purpose led social impact type businesses. Although I did um, read a piece which said that maybe it was a it was a, an HBR piece that said maybe they're actually not more inclined to do that. It's just women who do um, start social impact are more likely to get funding, which was really interesting. So um, so yeah, I might hand over to, to to Will and Michael to share their expertise in in those untapped areas. Yeah, I do want to highlight that that's a, a really important point, right? I think there's a lot of uh, organizations cropping up that are kind of looking at the investment uh, environment and thinking about is it sort of gender sensitive and tailored really to, to both male and female investors. So I think definitely an important one. Um, Will, maybe we'll go backwards on this one. Do you want to go ahead? Sure. Um, so, so I joined the Impact Investment Group seven years ago. Um, back then, you know, there, there were only a handful of organisations and intermediaries um, doing this type of work. Fast forward, there's there's been like a huge increase in the, in the number of groups, and we can start to see niching down, like in certain specialties and asset classes. So I think um, renewables is is an, is, a, is a logical no brainer. Um, there's there's green property that. Um, that makes a lot of sense. And I think it fits with the Australian psyche. Um, at dinner parties, we speak too much about um, housing prices and, and home loans and that sort of thing. And I think that translates quite well across the institutional fund managers and their um, bias toward property. Uh, I, th I think what's gonna be really interesting is uh, the rise of regenerative agriculture. So Impact Investment Group has launched an alternatives fund, uh, renewables, is, is part of that alternative strategy, so is VC. But the thing that's piqued a lot of interest from investors and, and our investor base includes family offices, institutional investors, high net worth individuals and foundations has been uh, the regenerative agriculture product that really isn't offered out in the marketplace as yet, but it's something I think that's gonna really take off over the next few decades um, for all the right reasons. Um, in terms of instruments, I think there's some really amazing, sophisticated, smart people who are designing really great instruments. I don't think an instrument solves anything in and of itself. Like coming back to the conditions, you know, so much of it is about, the, maybe I'll translate it into the um, startup world. I think one of the challenges uh, in creating the conditions for success in the startup world has been that we don't have as many successful entrepreneurs who created businesses 10, 20, 30 years ago that are now mentoring the next generation of, of startup um, founders. So um, I think that it, it's not just about finding a really great um, instrument to, to measure and report and um, su support uh, impact outcomes. It, it's as much about having the right people at, in every single step of the value chain um, 
to, to help create successful conditions. Um, I might pass to Michael there. Yeah, thanks, Will. A, a couple of observations, one on um, just coming back to the gender balance lens. I mean, certainly one of the deep learnings for me, having spent most of the last two decades in the social enterprise impact investing space, um, I think you're destined uh, to have a really suboptimal board and management structure if there's not careful attention to balance and particularly to gender balance. The most, uh, I think, productive, enjoyable board I've had the privilege of being part of was at Good Start. And it was because we were very explicit and dimensional about the spread of skills and backgrounds that we needed on that on that board. And, um, you know, there were that you had people like Wendy McCarthy, who has a storied background in both business and as an advocate, uh, as a teacher who really got social issues, but who really got business. Uh, Lyd Wannan, who's sadly no longer with us, um, two decades of deep experience in childcare and early learning. Uh, Robin Crawford, who was the founding chair, one of the founding directors of Macquarie Bank, but with a deep passion and a deep desire to learn actually from people who could contribute at the board table. So that idea that we can make one and one equal more than two, I think is profoundly anchored in having those eclectic views from around the table. Um, then more specifically, um, on the, uh, we, we spoke about this a bit in the interim report, I think in unbundling the market and opportunities and um, I think what's happened, the green, uh, the, certainly the carbon price and green bond market, my old friend and colleague from Macquarie Bank and SVA, Ian Learmont, who I think is doing a terrific job in running uh, the $8 billion pool of funding at CEFC, Clean Energy Finance Corporation. That to me is a really good example of a large scale investor that's responding to a sensible pricing mechanism and crowding in other funding. Now, our challenge in the social impact space is how do we recreate that across a broader diversity of markets? You know, I think Good Start's been a good precedent for that. Um, I think there are obvious opportunities across a broad spectrum of those areas where there's large scale revenue generation and measurable social purpose. You know, aged care is an obvious example. I mean, who amongst us is going to look at that and say, gee, I'm going to put my aging parents happily in a for-profit publicly listed aged care home. Um, it really hasn't worked all that brilliantly, has it? And and then I think if you drop down specifically, one of the things that we spent a lot of time looking at, uh, which is an area where SVA was involved in developing uh, the first social benefit bonds. You know, so I think there's some really interesting examples where you've got appropriate, ethical, thoughtfully developed pricing mechanisms where you can price human services outcomes and the government uh, in the process of saving demonstrably from that can reward investors. So the first social benefit bonds, as some on this call will be aware, we're in the really challenging area of foster care. And the program that SVA is supported by Uniting Care called New Pins, what it essentially did was say, well, we think this is a really innovative pioneering program. It seems to be doing a really good job of reconnecting children not to five with their birth parents. And the social and economic outcomes of that are really strong. So out of that out of that saving, investors uh, in that in that bond could get an eight or nine percent return. Now, I use that as a specific example of where we think there's quite an opportunity, as has happened in the UK, to scale and repeat that and encourage behaviour that has long-term programs uh, able to build the capacity based on a clear outcomes focus. And we think there's a really powerful market opportunity there if it's done thoughtfully and well. So I think there's, you know, again, this comes to the point about if we're clear about developing products and there's a deeper understanding of what the social purpose metrics and the financial returns are, what we consistently heard from many players and, you know, Will would, well, I'm sure would agree with this and, and Gemma hopefully has been a beneficiary of it. That there are now a number of, uh, high net worth and foundations and funders who are saying, hey, we've done X, we've invested in social enterprise or social benefit bonds, but we actually want to do 3X or 5X. You know, we've got a foundation which has got 100 million in the corpus. We want that to be 10% allocated to impact investing, but the products aren't there yet. You know, so this goes to this point about how do we collectively transform a cottage industry into something much more sophisticated. So those numbers are at 10%. So that 3 trillion does have a 2 to 3% allocation to impact investing. And I guess on that, um, you know, following on that question of how do we sort of collectively transform the cottage industry, um, it would be great to hear um, from each of you, you know, who as a sort of type of stakeholder do you think has the, the sort of power to be truly catalytic 
in doing so? And, and you know, at the next step, what would you like to see them do? So I know, Michael, you've already talked about the government a bit, but maybe uh, dig in there. And then selfishly, I would love to hear a foundation perspective as well, because I you know, tend to think that there is a you know, real role to be played there as well. Yeah, no, thanks. Just a, a couple of points on that. Um, I'm a, a firm believer in the case principle. And in case people mistake that for the Harvard case study, it actually stands for copy and steal everything. Um, so in that spirit, if you look at what's worked in other countries, um, we found at the task force, and uh, I guess through my involvement in the market generally, I've had the privileged opportunity over the years to spend time with people like Sir Ron Cohen, who did the original social impact investing task force in the UK in the early 2000s. And to answer your question, you can point to a bunch of things that Ron Cohen recommended that originally Blair and Brown picked up, uh, the idea of matched funding, the idea of capacity building funds, um, Ron Cohen did a fabulous job of making that bipartisan. So he enlisted David Cameron, who was a conservative prime minister, embraced that social impact agenda. He set up Big Society Capital, which was a 400 million pound wholesaler that really catalyzed larger scale impact investing. So unashamedly, the task force has cased the work of UK and Ron Cohen. And you'll see in both the interim report, and I've got to tread a bit carefully in this, but if I can point, um, the final report is not yet public. It, it's lodged with the government, but uh, there was a very thoughtful piece that uh, Helen Trinker wrote in The Australian a couple of weeks ago, and I'll come back and send the, send the copy back uh, through to you, uh, to, to, to those who are interested. But it does quite a thoughtful job of saying, hey, here's what the line of sight to the likely report recommendations are. And it is about government as an enabler, as a partner, as a catalyst. And one of the things we've done at the task force, which builds on the market opportunity is, how do we create partnership funding models from those who are already active working with government to set up the sort of enduring high quality independent institutions that stand out like beacons in the UK, big society capital that's invested 600 million pounds. It's leveraged more than two and a half times that in other investments. Um, one of the original ventures that was a beneficiary called Bridges Community Ventures. It started with Ron Cohen and mates pound for pound matched by government, 20 million pound social enterprise fund in 2003, now run by the remarkable Michelle Bridges, that manages a pool of more than a billion pounds of broad based impact and social investment funding. So that's, that's the kind of energy and momentum that we need um, to, to set that up uh, for success. And, and just very quickly to answer the second part of your question, um, one of my other hats is uh, have the privileged opportunity to chair the Paul Ramsey Foundation, which is a quite unique thing in the Australian firmament. It's a $4 billion foundation that was set up uh, when Paul Ramsey passed away, the founder of Ramsey Healthcare. He left virtually all of his equity to set up a foundation with very few directions about how to use that. So uh, we're delighted to have on board Glenn Davis, who's been a terrific and strategic CEO. So we're very focused around cycles of exclusion and disadvantage. But you know, one part of that, back to back to where we started the conversation, is we're very explicit about wanting to be a leading partner and player in impact investing. You've got a, a super quality guy, Abel Ashmedalia, who was recruited out of Ron Cohen's Global Steering Group Impact Investing Network, who heads up that part of the Ramsey Foundation. And the objective over time is to do things of both a smaller scale but larger scale. So, you know, our hope is that five to 10% of that corpus, that $4, $4 billion, is actually a, a, a leading uh, partner and enabler and investor in impact investing. And, you know, we're confident that that's a lead. There are a number of foundations. My colleague on the Social Impact Investing Task Force Expert Advisory Group, uh, Catherine Brown, who's CEO of the Lord Mayor's Charitable Fund, uh, under her leadership, they've been a terrific leader and innovator and funder in that space. So I think foundations have got a critical role to play. Great. Anything to add? Yeah, I, I, I will add something, Lisa. Um, I think I think Michael gives a fantastic perspective. You know, from the with the various hats that he wears, um, in terms of foundations and super funds. I, I spend a lot of my time with um, families um, and I have to say that they've, they've done an outstanding job in terms of taking the early stage risk on unproven um, businesses, products, instruments. Um, it's, for me, they're really at the vanguard of effectively helping to build out this evidence set for later stage, more sophisticated um, intermediary type groups who can make decisions on 
the behalf of a number of their clients. So um, I, I see it um, in terms of the critical pathways and the path of least resistance, there are different actors playing different roles at different points in time. So we have the, the families taking that early stage risk um, and hopefully what it does is it builds this evidence set to then crowd in groups like financial advisory firms who have independent experts who are undertaking due diligence, have got independent research departments, but they need track record. They need evidence. They can't just believe in a founder's compelling story. Um, and, and from there, I believe that uh, we can hopefully unlock the, the bigger dollars from the institutions and so on who have you know, minimum check sizes, Michael, correct me if I'm wrong, that could be $200 million plus. So we don't necessarily have the homogeneity of product necessarily yet to satisfy um, their structural limitations. So I, I really see it as each, each different group has a different role to play at a different point in time. And look, if I can just add to that, I think Will's absolutely spot on. You know, what happens where you've got these relatively immature markets, you know, you're, you're highly, highly dependent on people who are prepared to take a risk, who see something and are prepared to back it that's a little bit different. You know, going back to that original capital raise, uh, for good start, not for want of trying, we talked to institutions, but, you know, it was a bit different. It didn't fit, fit their traditional risk return. It was a little bit hard. You know, they're not paid to do innovative. They're paid to be conservative and avoid risk. And again, I'm old enough to remember vividly when I was cutting my teeth in the early 90s, you know, carrying your bag around, pitching the super funds about private equity and venture capital and you get responses like oh you know it's pretty risky australia is a small country you know well the same punters 10 years later were, were out of a job if they didn't have a four to six percent allocation in vc and private equity and i think the same opportunity exists so the default for us in good start and i'm sure will and Gemma have had the same lived experiences um, you go to people who are compassionate you go to people who are wealthy and you go to people who are prepared to back this um, and good start, you know, we finished up raising from 41 investors, um, one of whom is on this call. And good start would never have happened without that preparedness of people who were prepared to back the idea that you could do something different. And those people, I think, were well rewarded financially and I think deeply rewarded because they were part of a proof point of something that what I did say, which I'll repeat, is that we have to understand in the super fan market, which is a market I understand a little better now, is that you know, you do have a bit of Luddite mentality, which is there's a bunch of people at decision-making investment level who won't invest in something unless it bites them on the backside as an obvious opportunity. You know, so the challenges for all of us who are true believers in this, you just have to create the proof points. There's, here's, you know, here's Will's pioneering VC fund. And in 10 years time, mate, I can guarantee that if you've generated the 20% plus returns, you won't have a problem raising your next 100 or 200 but there mightn't be believers now. And equally for me with for purpose partners until we've got another two or three deals like Good Start and can say, look at what you missed. I mean, I had one CEO of a super fund who I won't name saying to me, um, gee, I wish I was around when Good Start was there because I would have made sure that my fund invested in Good Start. And I think, well, I think that's BS because you've just had an opportunity to invest in something we're doing now and you've passed and you've passed because you don't have the ability to drive the sort of behaviour. You will support us, but you'll probably only support us when we're five years down the track and we've got another half dozen deals and then you'll get it because the people who are making decisions will say, oh, how did we miss that? I mean, I've lived in that movie before. Yeah, um, I, I, I had a reflection on, on this moment uh, Michael, because, you know, I've been raising capital, I don't know, for 15 years and can experience the transition. We're going back to market with Giant Leap 2 and it's just so much easier. Giant Leap 1 nearly killed me. You know, it sucked the blood, sweat and tears. It was horrendous. Um, having that track record now, it, it just makes every, there's so much more inbound. It's not so much outbound. Um, but I, I do empathise with founders because, the, the rejection rates, you know, are just like, if we're only investing in one in a hundred, like um, it's, it's really tough on the other side for founders. But I, I just wanted to ask you a question, Gemma, because Michael spoke about um, the true believers early on and, and often they're compassionate. And one of the things that I've noticed, I haven't done, I haven't run the numbers to do the comparison directly, but 
in, in, in our impact product, we have a high skew towards females, like female investors who are supporting impact um, product and they're willing to take that risk early on when there isn't that clear data there. Is that something that you've seen firsthand yourself? Yeah, definitely. Well, our lead investor, um, so the first person that gave us money was Kim Jackson, who's the wife of Scott Farquhar, co-founder of Atlassian. Yeah, um, and certainly most of the female-led businesses um, from an entrepreneur's perspective are also have some type of social impact at their core. Um, but it's unsurprising because even if you look at not-for-profit groups like Engineers Australia, obviously um, there's significantly less than 50% of engineers are women. However, with Engineers Australia, they're a not-for-profit group that, you know, builds back after there's been a natural disaster. So it's volunteer-led. But more than 50% of the women volunteering for Engineers Australia, sorry, more than 50% of the people volunteering for that organisation are women. So I think definitely women are more kind of skewed to that piece. And that's why... At the end of the day, organisations also want women in their leadership roles and on their boards, you know, for that corporate social responsibility piece and bringing all of um, social impact in as well um, from an enterprise perspective. Thanks, Gemma. And actually, I'm just going to follow up on that. Um, you know, we're talking about sort of the catalytic roles that different uh, organisations can play. But curious to hear from you, I mean, what was catalytic for you from your experience, you know, first in terms of getting that first investment, and then now that you've been able to scale, what really enabled it? Um, so I went through the Start My Accelerator program, and that was very, very much catalytic for us. So in that three months that I was in the accelerator, we raised $3 million. We rebuilt our, uh, sorry, $1 million. We re rebuilt our um, tech platforms from scratch and we launched into the UK. So that was uh, pretty full on for three months. And then obviously, um, actually within the three months after um, that accelerator, we raised another million dollars. And um, today, as I mentioned, 5.8. So aside from, um, the capital piece, I think um, having investors um, that are, um, you know, very helpful um, as well as a big piece. So I'm really pleased that we've chosen investors that are there to support us as well in terms of giving us introductions or mentorship. Um, one of the things that um, I certainly lacked, I think, in those early days was a really good network. And so when you tap into to great investors, they have a network and they're willing to help you leverage their network as well. Um, yeah, so, so networks, the accelerator and, and capital would be the, the three catalysts. Wonderful. Um, maybe one one last question for me. Of course, I, I have others, but um, I'll ask one question and then we can open up. I see there's at least one question in the chat um, and folks can sort of ask directly. Um, you know, a lot of the conversations I've been having over the past year, we've been talking about both kind of the threat and opportunity posed by um, COVID pandemic. So just curious to hear from, from you all is sort of uh, how has the pandemic both sort of opened up opportunities and what threats are you concerned about going forward for, uh, for impact investing or even just sort of social enterprises looking for, for capital? Maybe I'll kick off because we have a portfolio of 19 companies. So when we, when we first did our risk analysis for our portfolio back in March, we, we had a lot of catastrophics against um, the portfolio companies. Um, I'm very, very happy to say um, that we've got a 100% survival rate. Um, attribute a lot of credit to the government with the JobKeeper program, that, that was really critical. Um, some of the businesses had really big tailwinds. So we've, we've got an investment um, in a business called Your, Your Grocer, which does on, online deliveries from community shops to local communities. So, you know, um, profitable hiring, um, we were act actually able to facilitate um, another business that was shutting shutting down and furloughing its staff. Um, we were able to tra um, transition some trucks and drivers from from that business that was doing business um, deliveries to cafes across to your grocer. So that was really wonderful, and, and we saw that same collaboration within um, the Giant Leap Founder Group, where some businesses that were experiencing headwinds needed to reduce their engineers um, in the business and others that were receiving tailwinds were actually able to pick up those staff. Um, that, that was wonderful to see. Um, in, in terms of 
what we see from here, um, I think so much of it had to do with whether you were able to raise money pre-COVID that just gave you a big margin of safety um, to be able to weather the storm. Um, things, the ice has cooled in, in, the, in the fundraising market and people are able to, to raise again. So I'm, I'm quite optimistic about the startup ecosystem um, and in particular impact startups generally. Yeah, when um, when COVID hit, we were um, extremely worried, um, to say the least, and we were told by investors to to brace for the worst. Um, particularly as Work One Eighty is in the employment space, which is obviously um, one of the hardest hit um, industries. So we did move all of our team down to, to four days a week um, to reduce their their salary and obviously save funds. Um, however. Um, what happened was um, we didn't crash like we thought we were going to. In fact, we had organisations quadruple their spend with Work 180 um, because they started doubling down on inclusion and diversity during what is a very difficult time. And obviously, um, with the inclusion and diversity lens over it, that supports well-being and well-being during COVID is extremely important. And um, we pressed ahead with launching into the US through COVID. Um, and we have, we've been getting um, sort of 500%, 100% MRR growth month on month since launching into the US and some really big names over there come on board, such as Microsoft. So um, yeah, brace for the worst, but it, 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 um, there was a lot of positives, I think, to come out of what was a very difficult time. Yeah, and a couple of observations for me, and I'll look for, I apologise, my internet connection appears a bit patchy, so I'll look for the signal from you if it's uh, if it's not coming through. Uh, very much in accordance with Will, and this is with a Ramsey Foundation hat on, we did kind of a triage of the range of organisations we were supporting. And I think the uh, credit where it's due, JobKeeper was actually extremely effective across the board. There are really only one or two organisations from a portfolio of 41 or 42 that were, were kind of at existential risk, uh, which in the circumstances is not bad. Um, Observation two, I think, you know, uh, with, without being cliched or tried about it, there's a bit of a sense of don't waste a good crisis. I think people are more inclined to think about community, are inclined to be a bit more compassionate. And so I think there's a bit of a following wind in thinking about more broadly, how do we think about thoughtful, sustainable uh, investing? And that, that's not at all a bad thing. Um, and I think the third thing, which is obvious, but I said there's enormous sectoral variability uh, around COVID. You know, the, there's a lot of social, particularly social enterprise in smaller scale, uh, entertainment, hospitality. You know, a lot of that's just been shredded. So, yeah, fine being on JobKeeper, but, you know, social enterprise is about giving people a hand up, an opportunity to build self-esteem, to build confidence, to get a foot into the workforce. Um, and that's been really patchy and challenging. I think longer term, you know, I do think, across the board, the response of uh, JobKeeper and spending is entirely appropriate. You know, the, the kind of $64 billion question is what happens uh, when you've got a government that's inclined to be more fiscally conservative, when and what basis does that start to dry up? To dry up? And, you know, the, the brutal realist in me says we're probably facing a period of at least a few years of really challenging double digit employment when we come out of this. And I think we all know what the what the social and moral consequences of that can be if it's not handled thoughtfully and well. Thank you all. Um, let me take, take a moment now. I think we're, we're an hour and I think it's a good time to maybe turn to, to folks on the line. And I think Shrikant, you had a question. So I'm happy for you to, to go off mute and turn on your camera and ask it directly. Oh, sure. Uh, thanks for that, uh, Lisa. So essentially, uh, I'm wearing the industry hat now. So as investors, uh, we have multiple people on the group here. So when you're looking at uh, assessing the performance of your investments, uh, would you have any additional criteria apart from the typical startup uh, criteria measuring the in impact itself? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thanks for the question, Srikanth. Um, so what Giant Leap does whenever we identify a company that we want to invest in is that we will sit down with the founders and co-design a metric with them that measures the impact that's within every dollar of revenue that's generated. And the reason that we've taken that approach rather than having a look at the long list 
of metrics that are available through groups like IRIS and so on is that ultimately we take a bit of a Warren Buffett type view. So I don't want Gemma creating reports for us that are meaningless to her. That is an absolute waste of time and that would make us terrible investors. So we, we believe that if um, we can help to co-design a metric that is meaningful to Gemma, that's meaningful to her staff in communicating the mission, that's meaningful to her existing customers and potential customers, that is valuable. Because that, at the heart of it, is the business. Yep. So we are very flexible, we're very pragmatic. And in actual fact, the, um, the metric that we've co-designed for founders when we first invested may change over time, but we have faith that because we make an assessment, each of us makes an assessment on the, on the intent behind why the founders are creating the business that will be able to identify the right metric in the long run. And we're also investing in businesses that are very, very early and they're gonna change and pivot and evolve over time. And that's one thing, and I'm interested in Michael's view on this. Um, impact is iterative. We've got to respond. We're constantly trying to create, um, create things that are responding to changing external and dynamic environments. So um, we need to be responsive. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, look, I think it's such an important question. I mean, let me start by saying, I mean, 110% agreement with Will about the significance of making sure there's deep alignment in the reporting framework between the board, the senior management team about what you're doing. If you, if you don't have that, you're really uh, destined to have a serious set of problems. And it goes to the heart of what the organisation's about. I'm just, a, I, I think there's a lot of variability, uh, which Will is suggesting case to case, and it's really important to determine that. So let me give a quick practical case study example and come back to Good Start. At the front end of Good Start, writ large was the idea that we could run this with business disciplines for social purpose and that, that inevitably that there'd be point in, points in the organisation life where there was some trade-off around that. You know, we inherited a turnaround business. We had 165 million in debt. And if we weren't respectful in both running the business well and repaying the debt, it was like a fail at the first hurdle. But what we're also equally explicit about, uh, and this was from the four nonprofit partners, we wanted and knew we had to make a real difference to the quality of early learning in the 702 centres that we bought. So an emphasis on the quality of learning we wanted, and we expected that this we might have more capacity with the uh, improving financial performance to do this. We wanted to make a specific uh, difference in areas of inclusion, so that in the particularly the centres in the tougher postcodes, could we make a real difference in terms of access and opportunities? So that was area two. And area three, that is the largest provider in the market, we want it to be an influential voice in terms of advocacy and lobbying to Australia uh, has often been off the pace in terms of early learning commitments in childcare policy. And that the sense was if we could do that and do that well, and I wanted to acknowledge actually the presence of somebody who was a practical voice of affirmation and inspiration on this call and my friend at old business school classmate, Alice Hill, who said to me, in, Alice, it would have been 2006. If you're going to do anything at social ventures, get stuck into early learning. It's the most important area and Australia's off the pace and we were. You know, so back to those practical three areas, as we repaid the debt, there's an obvious nexus between doing better quality and demand. You know, word of mouth in the centres got better and better because we were a good provider to go to. That matters and it helped drive demand. Easy self-reinforcing loop. Um, the inclusion issue was obviously had a deep moral dimension. As we paid off the debt, we had more and more capacity to invest in professional development. We're proud of the fact that of our network of centres, there are 136 in bottom end C for one, two and three, that's bottom 30% postcodes. We knew that they in many cases required more investment and we tracked that. So if you look at a, a quarterly Good Start board report, you'll see measures of quality. You'll see measures around um, inclusion and access and opportunity. And in the third area, this is a little more challenging to define, but we think probably amongst the most valuable work Good Start has done and the give huge credit to the CEO, Julia Davis, and has just done a fabulous job in engaging across the sector and engaging with government to get childcare and early learning much more on the radar. So that's been a harder thing to measure, 
but we were prepared to make an investment, A, in getting a really high quality on team, team on board five years ago, B, at the front end of good start to have a global thought leaders group, literally from around the world of sector leaders who could help us think about how to advocate um, and drive change. And then the third part of that was working very carefully and in partnership across the sector. And we've learned a lot about measuring and tracking that, but you know, for obvious reasons, that's kind of a harder thing to measure, but we always felt if we didn't commit to that, um, we'd, we would miss something really significant in what we were trying to do. So hopefully that helps in shedding a bit of practical light about how we've looked at it, at least through a good start lens. Oh, definitely, that's a very detailed, Michael and uh, Will. Thanks for the responses. Back to you, Lisa. I think there are a few more questions. Um, maybe, uh, Peter, if you want to turn your video on and uh, ask your question. Thanks. Uh, this is probably a bit of a boring capital markets question, but I'm, sure, I'm hoping Michael will pick it up. Um, our firm does, uh, uh, we've basically created our business on a uh, cold steel uh, approach to investing, um, basically justifying it on returns, but um, focusing, I suppose, on climate and inclusion are our big focus areas, and that's a positive screen that we put over what we do. Um, we've been successful in trying to co-mingle large pools of capital with the community sector, which has actually required quite a lot of innovation. Um, but in looking at some of the stuff that's being done on the venture side, one of the things that I, I'm, I'm trying to you know, extrapolate and think about how we actually drive the growth here is a secondary capital market that's accessible and observable for you know, exited deals for the guys you, you know, for the guys that you are supporting. And where people can evidence, I suppose, a value and a price for an instrument that is trading that has a social impact in it and therefore has a better price on it. Um, I've spent a lot of time in the super industry like you have. Uh, you guys have bashed your head against a lot of walls too. The sole purpose test gets dropped on the table all the time and all these sorts of things. Uh, we all know we're getting better returns, but we're playing in alternatives which also makes us really, really vulnerable. I'm wondering whether the success of this is to make it more mainstream, let the market determine the price of a social good and make it accessible in a, you know, a daily, hourly, weekly uh, market. And I think putting that on the table for you, Michael, given your fantastic roles that you've had in establishing various different organisations, but also now with the Ramsey Foundation, uh, whether that's something you're considering as a way to stimulate other investment. No, thanks, Peter, for the question. And it's um, there's a huge amount of depth in that. So, look, two responses. One is, I think emphatically in the specific areas that I indicated, there's real opportunity for large-scale impact investing where there's defined and measurable social impact. But if you step back from all of this, I was deeply guided by my own personal experience. We invested in 42 companies in a 13 year history uh, of private equity at Macquarie. And if you say to me, hey, tell me what your best deals were, without hesitation, I think of three investments where at the front end, they are run by outstanding, charismatic, deeply ethical entrepreneurs. None of those entrepreneurs, when I first met them, said my objective is to make a lot of money. My objective is to do fabulous uh, ROE or maximise margins. What they did do was they had a really thoughtful, engaged approach, which did result in generating high value, but in an incredibly ethical way in terms of how they treated people, how they treated customers and how they dealt with the world. I don't think that's a coincidence. And I think to your broader question, certainly my belief, and you go back to some of that earlier work of uh, you know Jim Peters and the kind of good to great stuff, the common denominator of the organisations that have generally outperformed is a really strong set of values and ethics at the core. And while there's still a little bit of juries out, I think the range of funds that are focusing on these ESG type measures that pick up a longer dated cultural ethical uh, on ethical performance and values, I do think that the data will suggest they will outperform financially. And while that's at one level a much softer way of getting to um, getting people to think more explicitly about that. I do think, um, I do think the more evidence that you, that you look at, the more you'll see alignment around returns correlated with that, with that kind of behaviour. As I say, I do think there's a subset where we can be more explicit, you know, carbon pricing, specific pricing of that, where there's a minimal social or environmental good should be part of the equation. It should be part of the large scale capital equation. Yeah, 
Yeah, I think, I suppose more of my evidence that I was looking for in terms of, I hear Gemma's challenge of running around trying to look for money, Will's running around trying to look for money, relationships and connections are very important and exchange essentially diffuses all of that. You know, if I wanted to invest today in good start early learning, I can't find it. There's nowhere I can see a secondary market to be able to trade it and potentially we'll see it. If we look at things like the green bonds that have been issued, we can see a differential in pricing. You know, it's there, yeah. it's evidenced, it's available. I'm wondering whether that's something we should be trying to do is putting organisations like Gemma's and others and Good Start uh, and some of the community-based investments that you guys have made and we've made and putting them together into an exchange where investors can see an evidence, they can move their capital in and out. Uh, we take away so many of the barriers to entry that unfortunately as intermediaries, many of us are actually trying to solve. But I'm just wondering whether that's a better way for us to be trying to be able to achieve that is to get a capital market together, create a capital market for the community sector in general, that they can engage with directly and bring those ideas and maybe put ourselves out of jobs. Yeah. No, and, and look, I think we, we again, I'll tread a little bit carefully around the sort of the, the task force, but I think you'll see when that when that comes out, there's a really specific attempt. And I think Cohen did that really well in the UK, the idea that there's an office of social impact that part of BSC's core purpose is to integrate and collect and connect data. So they're adjacently located to Access Foundation, which supports earlier stage organisations. It's to your point, the greater there is uh, the more transparent, the more liquid these markets, the more clearly accessible and available the information is, um, you'll deal with that sort of information asymmetry problem. And I think we've got a long way to go, but you know, I do think, and I, I see this, I've had, without talking out of school, you know, you- Again, when you were about to say something potentially controversial, you cut out. Um... <laughs> Sorry about that. No, no worries. I think just looking at time, maybe we'll we'll, we'll move on to some of the other questions. Um, but uh, yeah, really, really great suggestion, Peter. Um, Mary, do you want to jump in with your question? And I'll say perhaps let's keep uh, to three or four minutes per question as I see a few more coming in. Hi, yeah, um, nice to see everyone. Just a quick question in the context of established charities and um, how social impacting investing, if there's some good examples of the more established charities as opposed to the startup model, uh, co-investing or project-based investing in, a, in the social impact model um, with those bigger organisations. Um, look, hopefully, is that audio coming uh, through okay? Yeah, look, no, thanks, thanks for the question. And I, I think, um, the Australian market is really unusual uh, relative to some global comparators. We do have a concentration of larger scale nonprofits. And I think what I would, would observe, particularly over the last 10 or 15 years, a lot of them, and it goes back to the talent question, the boards and senior management teams are much more cross pollinated with people who come from both a background in the social sector, social purpose sector, but also out of the business world and often have been quite proactive and thoughtful. You know, when we did the first social benefit bonds in Australia with Uniting Care, that was very much a product of a board saying, hey, this is interesting, it's risky. Uh, we have to get our heads around the exposure of taking in capital from external investors. And if we don't perform, that's really challenging for us as an organisation. But they did it, you know, and it wouldn't have happened without the leadership support of Lynn Hatfield Dodds, who was a very thoughtful uh, strategic CEO. And it wouldn't have happened without her being supported by a board who said, this is a really interesting and strategic way for us to potentially develop more capital. So, you know, my sense is um, a lot of the bigger nonprofits are being more thoughtful and strategic. Um, again, if I'm being candid, I still think there are a number who are highly dependent on government funding, uh, where most of their revenue streams come through government. If, it, you know, if you've got an organisation that's 90 or 95% dependent on government funding, not surprisingly, that may be where they spend most of their time in terms of the relationships in the network instead of being perhaps a bit more thoughtful and creative in tapping into the other sources of funding out of the social impact investing market. And uh, so there, there are some gaps there. Thanks, Michael. Um, I have one that's come privately for, for Gemma, which is, um, you know, we've heard a little bit about uh, some of the learnings that you have from, from scaling. Anything you would have done completely differently? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, there's definitely there's definitely a few things. So um, when we first uh, launched into the UK, we took with us the same level of criteria that we assess employers on in Australia. And um, we were obviously in, established in Australia for three years. And so we had the kind of brand presence and trust where you could go to an organisation and say to them, show us all of your sensitive data around your gender gap. But taking that to the UK when you're brand new, no one knows who you are and saying, give me all this information probably didn't go down entirely well right at the beginning so I think it was just remembering that yes you, you're known here but you need to almost a little bit kind of take it back to basics when you're launching over there and build that trust piece with what we're doing and um, the other learning I think is actually we hired um, a senior leadership team in Australia we're now looking at um, hiring key members of the senior leadership uh, team in the priority markets where we want to grow so the UK and the US are high priorities for us and so getting senior leaders on the ground there to build those out rather than being located located here in Oz. Great thanks um, and I think David may have uh, have dropped off already um, but Dean if you want to go ahead and, and ask your question. Yeah, th thank you very much, Michael, and um, and the whole team. We're, I'm involved uh, in a business, building a business called IQ Energy, and the founder happens to be on the line. So Charles Foster is, is here. He could possibly describe it better than I, but he was birthed uh, out of the developing world, seeing waste, seeing rubbish everywhere, and wanting to do something about that, obviously for social and health impact as well as environmental impact. Um, but I guess... We're seeking to build a profitable business here in Australia um, so that we can get to the developing world. And so I guess largely the impact uh, is more environmental than social in many respects, although obviously the business case has to add up um, in terms of you know keeping, keeping waste out of landfill, uh, converting it into pretty valuable products like energy and biochar and things. But um, I guess my question is, for impact investors, um, does the impact being environmental rather than social, does it change any dynamics? Does it still work the same? Thanks. I can give Giant Leap's perspective. So, um, Dean, we, we look for social or environmental impact in any investment that we make. And ideally, we get both. Um, so we've invested in two businesses that seek to address the waste problem. Um, one that I mentioned before was called GoTerra. So it's a black soldier flies. We all also invest in a business called Full Cycle. So they are headquartered in the US. Um, they take organic waste as well. And they put it through a big machine and they turn it into compostable plastic. Plastic that's actually compostable in, in your backyard, but it, even if it gets into the waterways, it breaks down and becomes fish food as well. So um, waste fits within our sustainable living themes. Um, it's something that we're, we're seeking to address. And as, as you said, um, if there's uh, a, a commercial return that meets the expectation of, of the investors and the, the mandate, like if they're an intermediary like us, but we, we know lots of families um, that, that are interested in addressing this problem. Um, there's a big fund, I think, that was is, is seeded by the likes of Coca-Cola Amatil. I think it's called o something to do with ocean cleanup. I can't remember exactly. I can dig it out and send it to the um, There's, the, yeah, it's a big fund that's um, that's provided by some some of the biggest plastic producers, um, and and that's uh, looking looking for homes as well. So there's definitely capital out there for this sort of problem. Yeah, look, I, I agree. And I think, Dean, it sounds like your enterprise is one that does have both social and environmental benefit. And I think that's great. I mean, there is a little bit of horses for courses. Some funders will have a particular focus on either of those and might be less attracted if there's elements of both. I and mean, personal view is if you can do both of those things and be clear about what the outcomes are on both fronts, uh, you're in better shape in terms of attracting capital. And I think there is a fusion between both of those, particularly in the enterprise space in many areas. 
Yeah, I think that's a, a great question. One I think about quite a lot. I think, at least for me, it seems to come down, you know, with folks that we work with to to what can you actually measure. Um, and oftentimes you can indeed sort of clearly show the impact on that environmental side. It's a bit trickier um, with some social issues. Um, Adam, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, sure. I'm just trying to turn on my video. Can you hear me okay? Uh, we can hear you, but, but not see you yet, but feel free to go ahead. All right, okay, uh, question to, to either Michael or Will. Um, to what extent do you feel that perhaps social impact can afford to discount maybe financial returns when you're looking to balance financial returns with social yield in, in a well-established asset class like commercial property? So where uh, my organization, Ethical Property Australia, we're looking to obviously turn uh, a very traditional asset class uh, into something that will benefit the community. Um, and we're targeting, say, a 5% yield and a 10% total return. To, to what extent, though, can social impact discount that sort of level of, of return? Because there are obviously expectations attached with traditional asset classes like, like property. Yeah, look, I'm happy to have a first crack at that in hand to Will. I mean, it goes back to that conversation. If I put on a super fund trustee hat on i have a legal exposure if i'm seen as a trustee not to be acting in the best interests of members in terms of driving financial returns so if there's a sense that there's some kind of trade-off between commercial and social that's a potential exposure i um i think that's absolutely manageable as some of the previous uh conversation would indicate but what i think you do have to prove is that there's a sort of a virtuous circle around the social and environmental benefits and a nexus between that and longer dated returns. And so, you know, sticking with something like a good start, and I would think, you know, obviously, you know, the property market back to front, there'd be parallels. You are more likely to get high quality, reliable, long-term tenancy if you've got a six-star energy rating building that's doing a set of things. That's likely to be an economic protection. I mean, in one of the recent conversations, uh, to paint an extreme example is that why would you invest in uh, thermal coal at the moment? Because there's a high risk that's going to become a stranded asset very quickly. Now you don't have to be a, you don't have to be a political suicide to see that there's an economic exposure if you're investing things that are suboptimal. And so, I think the case we've got to be more thoughtful, more clear around is the nexus between high quality ethical behaviour and economic returns. Particularly bearing in mind, you know, as an example, the fund that I'm on the board of, we have 1.4 million members, their average age is 38, their average account balance is $48,000. Now, what does that tell you? It certainly tells you if you're serious about helping those people fulfill their retirement dreams, you better be having a 10 to 20 year perspective on things. And so I think integrated with that, the idea of ethical behavior connected to uh, strong economic returns um, is a really important part of that. Okay, great. The uh, the point you sorry Will you carry on if you're going to answer. Uh, I'm going to say what Michael said, but in a different way. So for me, it's about quality. So um, sometimes impacts can be seen as inferior in terms of quality, whether it's finance trading or some sort of financial return because the the proposition is of a lower quality. It could be increased risk. It could be a lower return. Some people are willing to trade off. Um, a financial return for that impact and they don't see it as inferior quality at all. It's like a different, it's a different perspective. How many people, how deep a pool is, it, is there for people that are willing to take that view? Um, in my experience, it's, it's, a, it's a smaller pool and it's harder to find those people. It takes a really long time. So I think Michael's perspective is really fascinating. I think it's, um, it's the right perspective. It's taking a long-term view about building high quality assets um, with, with a long-term horizon. It's, it's not saying something's inferior. It's just, it's just, it's got a different axis. And, and if I could just add one very quick point, because it's fresh in mind, uh, Adam, to your point around property and the, where government's done a thoughtful and sensible job of providing appropriate pricing incentives it crowds in capital. Um, so get, let me give a quick example. You know, there's now a half billion to billion dollar 
social and affordable housing market that NDIS has created. How has that happened? Because there's a thoughtful, well-constructed pricing mechanism that rewards appropriately uh, those providers of high quality care for those uh, who are eligible under the NDIS. And it does so in a basis that provides an incentive and payment structure that means that you can get a, a, a reasonable commercial yield. And there's a range of providers, including Macquarie Bank, who've raised funding to support that. So what that tells you is that um, particularly in cohorts where and social and affordable housing is front and centre at the moment for good and proper reasons. I do think where government can support that with pricing mechanisms that encourage those investments to be made so that they sit more, uh, more appropriately on the risk return uh, spectrum really creates um, the sort of funding that you'd like to see at scale. And right. sorry, I have to, to jump in right now because we are five minutes off and I, I do want to give everyone a chance to say a final word. Um, so thanks, uh, thanks everyone for the questions. Um, this was a great conversation. It's exactly what I'm looking forward to when we can all uh, come together in person. Um, might just uh, uh, turn to uh, Gemma maybe to start. And I had one, one final question for you and then uh, feel free, free to share parting thoughts. Um, I'd be interested in hearing you know, what kind of misconception about either impact investing or social enterprise you'd like to correct for the group on the line. Um, but even before that, uh, any reflections you have to share about sort of choosing the right investor and feel free to ignore the fact that Will is on the line <laughs> as you answer <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 don't worry. It's all good things about giant lady. Um, I think um, it means a lot for Work 180 as a purpose-driven business to have an investor that is impact-driven and the support that they've given us to actually help define our metrics and measure our purpose. Um, because by defining those metrics and measure, uh, measuring the purpose, it really motivates us as founders, but also the people that choose to come and work for us as well. So I think having a social impact investor is has been awesome. Excellent, thanks, Gemma. Uh, Will, final words? Um, in terms of myths, I'm, I'm gonna present two myths that may seem like they're in contradiction with one another. So one is that um, impact can't outperform. I, I think we've, we've spoken, there's lots of examples of responsible investment, ESG, where, where there are there are superior returns and I spoke about capable capital, but at the same time, we're talking about impact as a concept that is across all of these asset classes. You can't directly compare a lot of the strategies, a lot of the underlying assets. There is no silver bullet. And there are things like Giant Leap, we're looking for commercial risk adjusted returns. We are not going to address homelessness. Like philanthropy has its place. Um, sub, sub commercial returns have their place. Um, it, it's a broad church. Uh, there's, there's lots of distinctions, there's lots of complexity, but I just th think it's really important that we get out there and give it a go, because that's the only way that we can come up with, with solutions that are valuable. If we keep doing the same old thing, and, and I'm talking to every single actor in the decision-making process, whether it's Gemma as a founder, it, whether it's any of you as, as founders or investors, when we're talking to our financial advisors, like we all have to take risk. We all have to be willing to change. We all have to be willing to be wrong. And that's scary, right? We, we all like success, we don't like failure, but I reckon that's, that's, that's our job. I'm gonna fail. Thanks, Will. Please go ahead, Michael, final word. Yeah, look, I, I think um, alignment is just so critical and is the key word for me. And, and I think what Will and Gemma are doing is providing a poster child example of what happens when you've got capital and support that's aligned with an entrepreneur who knows what they're doing, who are passionate about it. And the idea that you can most of us are used to uh, is something we don't want to drop the ball on. So uh, thanks for the opportunity to be part of this and sorry about the unstable internet. No worries at all, Michael. I've really, really appreciated your contributions even around the internet. Um, I'll, I'll take this moment to thank all three of our panelists, um, Gemma, Will, Michael, this has been truly fascinating. Um, really could not have asked for a better conversation and just sort of seeing that same amount of love in the in the chat box. Um, and also just wanna thank all of you who've joined um, for, for all of the questions, for the sort of avid participation. And we really look forward to doing another one of these sort of impact investing focus sessions. Of course, HAE is broader than impact investing, but between Michael Vitale and myself, I'm sure there'll be more of these coming up. Uh, thank you all for joining. And uh, as I said, we'll have this recorded and on the HAE website afterwards and we'll share with everyone. So thanks everyone. Take care. Thank you.